about the current the current state of diversity and also past efforts that have impacted how we've reached the state we are now and also discuss future challenges to diversity we see in academic medicine specifically looking at the lived experiences of students that have been historically excluded but before we do, I would like to begin talking about why diversity is even important in academic medicine. And I think there are numerous arguments, but I'd like to start with one of the most common evidence-based arguments, and that is the economic argument. And this is just a figure taken from McKinsey Quarterly in 2012, and it was one of the first and seminal articles that actually looked at how diversity among teams can impact um, performance. And in particular, what these investigators did was they looked at publicly traded companies in France, Germany, the United Kingdom, and the United States. And they stratified those companies by the ethnic and gender diversity of those boards into the top quartile and compared the bottom quartile. And what they found was in each country, uh, the publicly traded companies that were more diverse in terms of their leadership were the, also the more profitable companies. The conclusions that these investigators drew was that diverse companies and diverse teams are better able to problem solve, especially in rapidly changing and complex environments such as that of business. That being said, while I think we all know the old adage, uh, no mission without margin, I think we all entered into medicine for reasons more than just money. And in particular, I think as physicians, we obviously want to provide the best care possible to patients. And I think it's also important to reflect upon the impact of diversity on patient care. And it, it, this is just uh, some data taken from an article published in JAM Internal Medicine in 2014 that actually explored the role of non-white physicians in the care of uh, non-white patients, and particularly looking at primary care doctors. They used data from the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, which is one of the largest and most comprehensive surveys that examine healthcare costs and coverage in the United States. And what they found was that non-white physicians care for almost 53% of non-white patients and almost 70% of non-English speaking patients. The investigators also noted that non-white physicians were significantly more likely than their white counterparts to care for patients from a low socioeconomic status background or patients reporting to have Medicaid for insurance or no insurance at all. The conclusion these authors drew was that diversity in the healthcare workforce is important to both expand access and quality care to patients. While we're also physicians, I think all of us here also are educators. And I think, again, it's important to think about how diversity can impact the learning environment in medical education. Um, this is just data taken from about 600 medical students from both Harvard and Stanford in 2003. And when surveyed about the impact of diversity in their learning environment, 84% of students stated that the diversity in their classroom enhanced discussions. 77% noted that the diversity improved their understanding of treatment options available to patients. 86% of students noted that the diversity in their classroom gave them access to alternative viewpoints. And overall, 94% of students noted that the diversity of their classroom enhanced their overall educational experience. And this is actually a graph taken from one of my absolute favorite papers that looks at the impact of diversity. It's from a paper published in JAMA in 2008 by Dr. Sam Saha. And what's unique about this study is that Dr. Saha was actually interested in how the racial and ethnic diversity of medical school uh, classrooms impacted white medical students. And he used data from the Association of American Medical Colleges, in particular the graduation questionnaire, which is administered to all medical students in their uh, final year of medical school. And in particular, looked at two questions on the graduation questionnaire. One question looking at how students rated their ability to care for patients from backgrounds other than their own. And a second question that looked at whether or not medical students felt that healthcare should be a universal right. And again, Dr. Saha looked at strictly how white students responded to this question, but stratified those students based into quintiles based upon the percent of historically underrepresented students based on race, ethnicity in that classroom. And what you can see as we move from the lowest quintile diversity to the highest, white medical students were significantly more likely to state that they felt comfortable caring for patients from a background other than their own, and also significantly more likely, again, almost in a stepwise dose-dependent manner, more likely to endorse that healthcare should be a universal right. The conclusion that Dr. Saha uh, took from the, these uh, findings was that the diversity of the learning environment actually allows us to train and produce uh, more egalitarian and culturally competent physicians. Um, what I love about this study is that we often think about the benefits of diversity 
maybe perhaps being limited to a small group of individuals. But I think Dr. Saha shows here that diversity benefits everyone is in fact a team benefit. While we're also educators, I think we're also all scientists. And there've been several studies that show the impact of diversity on scientific teams. I mean, in particular, two studies have shown that as investigative teams have higher levels of gender diversity and also ethnic diversity, those more diverse teams are more likely to publish in high impact journals um, as rated by impact factor, and also more likely to have their publications subsequently cited their more homogeneous teams. And the last argument I like to bring forth is just the social justice argument, just stating that everyone, irrespective of their background, should have the ability and the right to thrive in the medical learning environment. And I think that now brings us to the state of diversity that we see now in the academic medicine. And in particular, this is a figure taken from JAM Internal Medicine in 2015 that looks at the compositional diversity based on sex and also race ethnicity, again, focusing on those historically underrepresented um, based on race ethnicity in medicine and looks at their composition in the United States and compares that composition of the spectrum of medical training to also independent practice. And what you can see here is that at every stage, as we move from the United States population to every phase of training in academic medicine, and also ultimately into independent uh, practice, we see six, um, substantially less diversity at each stage. And I think this figure is important because I think we all understand that there are factors extrinsic to uh, the house of medicine that limit diversity in the healthcare workforce that we see, such as structural racism, residential segregation, mass incarceration, and so forth. But I think this figure also shows that the barriers that we see in diversity are not solely extrinsic to the house of medicine, but also embedded in the house of medicine as well. Uh, nevertheless, the diversity we see in academic medicine today was not always the case. As you can see in 1970, less than 10% of all medical students were female and less than 3% were historically underrepresented based on race ethnicity. And again, when we look at race ethnicity, that 3% was largely concentrated in um, three to four historically black medical schools. Over time, we can see significant gains in diversity, especially based on gender and smaller gains based on race and ethnicity. And again, I think it's important to realize those gains did not happen by chance or accident, but were the result of several well-coordinated and intentional initiatives to increase diversity nationally. And I'd like to just spend a little bit of time on this figure taken from a very famous uh, publication in uh, the New England Journal of Medicine from 1994, uh, published by the, the very prominent Black psychiatrist, Dr. Uh, Herbert Nickens. And what Dr. Nickens does in this figure is he looks at the uh, compositional diversity of the United States population, again, focusing on those historically underrepresented based on race, ethnicity, and compares that to the diversity of medical school matriculants over three specific time periods. And I think it's important to realize that over each of the three time periods, the diversity of the United States population increased, although we see very different patterns based on the diversity of medical school matriculants. In the first phase that Dr. Nickens highlights, it's he calls the, the phase of social activism that was marked by the civil rights movement. In this phase, we see a significant increase in the diversity of medical school matriculants based on race ethnicity from about 3% to nearly 9% from 1968 to 1974. Um, during that time, there were significant coordinated efforts between leadership and the Association of American Medical Colleges and deans across the country uh, who sought to uh, both recruit and retain um, a more diversity in the entrance to uh, medical school matriculants. And in fact, focusing on several intentional efforts at historically black um, colleges as well. And those gains were successful up until what Dr. Nickens labels phase two, which he describes as a period of stagnation. And again, during this phase, we see the diversity of the United States population continue to increase, although we see it a stagnant, a more like a plateauing of the diversity among medical school matriculants. Dr. Nickens attributed this um, to a backlash um, to several high profile Supreme Court cases that challenged affirmative action. It's important to note though, in each of those instances, the Supreme Court upheld the use of race and ethnicity as at least one of many components of, in the application selection process for medical school matriculants. Nevertheless, Dr. Nickens felt that these Supreme Court cases um, 
had a chilling effect on the admissions committee of several medical schools across this country. And that was the case until what Dr. Nickens categorizes as phase three, which was actually marked by his own initiative, Project 3000 by 2000, which was a national initiative that Dr. Nickens uh, led in conjunction with the Association of American Medical Colleges, again, to um, partner with several um, universities nationally and historically black medical schools and schools in Puerto Rico to increase the diversity of medical school matriculants. And as you can see in this phase, um, we again begin to see a rise in the diversity of medical school matriculants. And while Dr. Nickens did not reach his goal of 3000 matriculants by 2000, his efforts coordinated nationally were very successful. And we continue to see those gains up until a period that has now been called the beyond Nickens or post Nickens period, where interestingly, unlike phase one or phase two or phase three, for the first time, we actually begin to see declines in the diversity of medical school matriculants as compared to the United States population. And again, this was attributed to additional uh, cases nationally challenging affirmative action. And that decline continued until the Liaison Committee on Medical Education or the accrediting body for all um, MD schools began to exert its own influence on diversity. And in particular, in 2009, the LCME introduced two diversity accreditation standards. And I don't want to belabor you with all the wording of those two standards, other than to emphasize that the standards included the word must, such that for the first time, medical schools were required to have programs and practices in place to have diverse students, faculty, and residents and to retain those individuals. And if they didn't and meet um, cri subsequent criteria, those medical schools could be cited by the LCME and ultimately lose their accreditation. And when we began to explore the influence of those accreditation standards, we used data from the Association of American Medical Colleges to look at how the diversity of medical school matriculants changed after those diversity standards were introduced. And what we found was just as uh, was shown in the Beyond Nickens period from 2000 Three to 2009, the percentage of women matriculants to medical school actually declined on an annual basis. In 2009, the diversity standards were introduced. And again, that decline continued, but the decrease was less than prior. And just two years after the standards were introduced, we actually see a sharp reversal in that trend of uh, women matriculants, such that for the first time ever in 2018, women were the majority of uh, matriculants to medical school. We see a similar pattern with black matriculants, although on a smaller scale. Again, from 2003 to 2009, the percentage of black matriculants was decreasing on an annual basis. And then by 2011, we see a reversal in that trend with annual gains in the percentage of black matriculants. For Hispanic Latinx matriculants, the percentage of Hispanic Latinx matriculants was actually increasing before the diversity standards were introduced, but that rate of increase almost doubled after the diversity standards were introduced by, in 2011. And concomitantly, by 2011, we see a 4.4% decrease in the percentage of white matriculants. And again, um, not only did the diversity standards were they associated with increases in diversity, but those diverse, uh, that level of diversity has been sustained. And again, in 2018, the, this is just a uh, caption from the WMC's website. The WMC you know, boasted for the first time ever, women were both the majority of applicants and matriculants and continue to note more modest gains based on race ethnicity. Interestingly, the ACGME, or the Accreditation Council for Graduate Medical Education, in 2009 introduced its own diversity accreditation standard using language that closely mirrored that of the LCME. And I think this is a pivotal moment because not only are we seeing gains in diversity in undergraduate medical education, but now we have the opportunity to see additional gains and uh, retention at the level of graduate medical education, which is needed as data continues to show uh, racial and ethnic disparities um, in access and equity and inclusion in the GME level. And this is just a figure taken from a study that you published last year that looked at the likelihood of medical students successfully matching from medical school into GME. And as you can see, this data shows that over a five-year period, um, essentially from 2016 to 2020, students of color were significantly more likely to not place into graduate medical education. And that is actually accounting for standardized test scores such as step one and step two. So again, I think with the ACGME in introducing their own accreditation standard, we have a significant opportunity to see persistent gains across the 
training. And I think it brings us now to a road in terms of what the future of diversity in academic medicine will entail. Will we see continuous gains like we did in phase three that Dr. Nickens uh, reported? Or will we see another period of stagnation, especially with the very high profile Supreme Court cases challenging affirmative action we're seeing today? Or even worse, a period like the beyond Nickin period, a period of decline. While the future obviously is uncertain, I think we can look at the lived experience of students historically excluded in medical school to gain a better understanding of what the future could entail and what those challenges are. And in particular, I'd like to just uh, show findings from three studies that looked at how students are perceived in the learning environment, how they're valued and ultimately included. And to start with how students are perceived, I'd like to talk about a study that we conducted that looked at the Medical Student Performance Evaluation Letter, also known as the Dean's Letter. In particular, we chose this letter because it's a structural component of every application from medical school to graduate medical education or residency training. Not only does it include the voice of the dean, but it includes the voice of other students, um, medical fellows, and faculty supervisors. So we felt that it would have the voice of the medical community. In particular, our data set included um, dean's letters from 6,000 medical students from 134 different medical schools applying to 16 different residency programs, all at one academic medical center. Um, as you can see here, our study cohort of about 6,000 students was very similar to all US seniors nationally that year. And in particular, we used uh, the Dean's letter to look for certain words that have been used in prior studies looking at uh, disparities based on gender or race ethnicity in letters of evaluation including words from um, standout words such as best, excellent, outstanding, ability words such as talented, grindstone words such as hardworking, and words of compassion such as having empathy. And what we found was that white students were significantly more likely than students of color to be described with standout words such as exceptional, best, outstanding, and bright, all with the exception of the word competent, uh, which was significantly more likely to be used to describe black medical students. Um, while competent was part of the standout word category, we actually felt that this was less likely a compliment, but more a term of minimal assurance. Um, additionally, we saw differences based on gender, with women being more likely to be described as caring, compassionate, or having empathy in these letters of evaluation. Um, so again, just in this one structural component of um, the medical learning environment, you can see that students are described differently in aggregate based on aspects of their identity. So additionally, obviously, we wanted to understand how students were valued in the learning environment. And to do so, we looked at the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Society. And in particular, we're interested in how membership in the Honor Society differed based on aspects of a student's identity. We chose the AOA Honor Society because it's often considered to be the highest honor that a medical student can obtain while in medical school. The Honor Society boasts over 150,000 inductees and notes that 75% of all US medical school deans are members, including 50 Nobel Prize winners and 11 of 19 surgeons general. Additionally, studies have shown that membership is associated with future success in academic medicine, with members being more likely to pursue uh, faculty appointments at medical schools, more likely to obtain the rank of dean, professor, and share the non-members. So again, we were very interested in how the composition of membership varied based on a student's identity. While each medical school is given significant discussion <laughs> by the National Honor Society and how members are chosen, the National Honor Society does have uh, general guidelines to guide schools on how members are chosen. In particular, in a given medical school class, only 25% of individuals are eligible for Honor Society membership, generally based on um, academic criteria. Nevertheless, of that 25%, only 16% of students will ultimately be chosen, um, given and up to the discretion of the particular medical school's AOA chapter. That being said, the Honor Society um, states that holistic factors such as leadership, community service, and, leadership, uh, and aptitude and research should be um, guiding criteria for how members are ultimately selected. 
So again, using a very similar data set, looking at um, student applications to, med uh, to graduate medical education, we obtained approximately 5,000 applications or ARIS applications. We eliminated all applications from um, medical schools that did not have an AOA chapter and applications from students coming from historically black medical schools. We felt that learning environment and the composition of students um, based on race and ethnicity would be different and ultimately eliminated students who did not self-report their race or ethnicity for about 4,600 applicants. From the ARIS application, we abstracted student demographics, including race, ethnicity, age, and sex, and proxies for AOA selection criteria, such as hours dedicated to leadership and service. In addition to other variables that might influence AOA membership, such as whether or not the student had a dual degree, such as a master's degree or a PhD, standardized test scores, including US Assembly Step 1, and number of publications. And as you can see, again, our study cohort was very similar in terms of demographics compared to US seniors nationally. And what we found was that members of AOA compared to non-members were significantly more likely to score in the top quartile of their US Assembly Step 1. Um, however, we saw no significant difference in hours dedicated to leadership activity or community service between members and non-members. Moreover, in our fully adjusted logistic model that again accounted for all the factors that we described previously um, in terms of student demographics, dual degrees, and also standardized test scores such as USM Lee scores, we found that students who self-reported their race or ethnicity to be Asian were almost half as likely than their white peers to be members of the Honor Society, and Black medical students were almost 80% less likely to be members, again accounting for all the variables we discussed previously. And you know, for after we did that study, for the longest time, we wanted to revisit AOA, but we weren't exactly sure how uh, best to do that until ultimately we reasoned that we could also begin to explore other aspects of a student's identity as well, in particular, focusing on socioeconomic status. So using the same ARIS application, we abstracted the same uh, data as before in terms of race, ethnicity, USMLE step scores. But we worked with the um, Association of American Medical Colleges to actually abstract socioeconomic data from the AMCAS application or the application that students use to apply to medical school, obtaining data such as the student's childhood household income, whether or not they were a Pell Grant recipient, and also whether or not that student had ever uh, reported receiving federal financial assistance, um, such as welfare or SNAP. And what we found was when we compared AOA to, uh, members to non-members, AOA members were significantly less likely to report having received a Pell Grant, significantly less likely to report having ever received federal aid, and also less likely to be a first-generation college graduate. In our multivariable logistic model, again, accounting for all the variables we described previously, we focused on childhood household income as a very granular measure of socioeconomic status. And what we found in an almost dose-dependent, again, stepwise manner, as a medical student reported increasing income, their likelihood of being a member of AOA increased, such that students reporting a childhood income from $125,000 to $200,000 were almost twice as likely to be members of AOA than students who reported a childhood household income of less than $50,000. In this much larger data set, including about 30,000 medical students, we again looked at differences based on race, ethnicity, and again, in our fully adjusted model, in this case, with a bigger data set, found that all students of color um, or all non-white students were less likely than their white peers to be members. So again, not only did we see persistent differences based on race ethnicity, but we also now begin to see differences based on socioeconomic status. And I think just because I couldn't get enough of AOA, we decided to do one third study that in this case, not only looked at race, ethnicity and socioeconomic status, but we also wanted to look now at how sexual orientation could influence membership. And in our prior studies, we looked at aspects of identity in isolation. But in this case, we also wanted to see how the intersection of these identities might influence membership. So again, we worked with the AAMC and in this case, obtained an even larger data set of about 50,000 medical students with the demographics that you see here. And what we found in our fully adjusted model taking into account intersectionality um, was what we have labeled as a, a phenomenon of cumulative advantage or cumulative disadvantage. And I, I apologize for this slide being busy, but essentially what we did here is as you move from the top of this figure to the bottom, students begin to report increasingly more numbers of 
identities that have been historically marginalized in medicine, such as female sex, non-white race, um, LGB uh, or lesbian, gay, bisexual, um, sexual orientation, or low income in terms of household income or low socioeconomic status. And again, as you go from the top to the bottom, students begin to report more of these such that the very first row, students report no um, marginalized identities and the very bottom row, students report being a member of each of these historically marginalized groups. And again, what you can see is that you move from the top of this figure to the bottom, students become, become progressively less likely to be members of the honor society. And I think these disparities in terms of identity and uh, privilege in terms of honor society membership have not gone unnoticed. And this is actually just a clipping from an, um, an NP article that actually looked at Mount Sinai and its own um, investigation into disparities in their honor society. And I think as you all are well aware that Mount Sinai actually looked at five years worth of data and found that uh, despite the incoming class of Mount Sinai being anywhere from 18 to 20% underrepresented in medicine a year, out of 120 AOA members during that time period, only five AOA members were from a historically underrepresented um, background. Um, since that time, as you all are, I'm sure, aware, Mount Sinai has suspended its AOA chapter. So we've looked at studies um, investigating how students are perceived and valued in the learning environment. And I just wanted to conclude with one study that looked at how students are included. And to do so, we investigated both the prevalence and the impact of microaggressions in the learning environment. And microaggressions, I think we all are familiar with the definition, but they encompass everyday verbal, nonverbal, environmental slights, snubs, and insults, whether intentional or unintentional, which communicate a hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to targeted persons solely based on their marginalized group membership. I think in many cases, microaggressions seem innocuous, but several studies, especially in higher education, have shown that the experience of microaggressions is associated with burnout, depression, and anxiety. And this is just a picture of um, Chester Pierce, the very prominent uh, black psychiatrist who coined that term originally. And again, while I think we're all aware of um, what microaggressions are. I just wanted to show some pictures from uh, this photo voice project done at Harvard University where undergraduate students actually uh, demonstrated some of the microaggressions they commonly experience on campus. And here you have uh, this, this student with a sign that says, no, it's not rap that I'm listening to. Or these students with signs that say, you don't speak Spanish. Or no, where are you really from? Or you don't act like a normal Black person, you know? You're not like the other Black people. I know, you speak so well. So again, we wanted to have a better understanding of the prevalence of microaggressions in medical school and how those microaggressions influence student wellness, in particular, positive screens for depression using the patient healthcare questionnaire too, and also how the experience of microaggressions impacted medical school satisfaction using questions adapted from the business literature. Uh, to create our survey of microaggressions, we adapted of a validated tool of microaggressions known as the Racial Ethnic Microaggression Survey and adapted it to better reflect the academic medical center learning environment, working with several student organizations uh, such as Student National Medical Association and Latino Medical Student Association. Um, ultimately, we identified 14 microaggressions that were felt to be common in the learning environment. And just to give you an example, um, I listed four of those um, items here and including things like people are surprised by how well I speak English or people mistake me for someone else who shares an aspect of my identity, or people imply I was admitted to medical school for reasons other than academic merit, or my ideas are ignored, but others are applauded when they say the same thing. If a student reported experiencing any of the 14 microaggressions more than a few times a year, we also would ask the student why they felt they experienced these microaggressions and had a, a variety of uh, possibilities for attribution, including race, ethnicity, sex, sexual orientation, religion, and if students didn't see a source of attribution, they could also write in why they felt they experienced that microaggression. We ultimately surveyed about 800 medical students oversampling students of color. And again, we looked for outcome measures. We looked at whether or not students screened positive on the patient healthcare questionnaire too. And again, several measures of medical school satisfaction. And in our study cohort, we found that just as, um, or as we, 
knew from prior studies and our study cohort, the experience of microaggressions was very common with about 50% of students reporting experiencing at least one microaggression a week and a little bit more than 25% of our study cohorts saying they experience microaggressions almost daily. The most common uh, sources of microaggressions were gender and race, but as you can see here, uh, students reported a, a, a vast array of dimensions as to why they felt they experienced uh, those microaggressions. And students were also able to write in personal experiences of microaggressions. And just to give you more context and granularity as to what students experienced, one student wrote, I had an older male physician as a first year mentor. I shadowed him every other week in his clinic for medicine intro or intro to medicine course. He would regularly introduce me to patients as a pretty face to talk to while you wait. Another student wrote, I choose to wear my hair in its natural state sometimes. And one of the professors made a comment. Did you get electrocuted? After that comment was made, him and another professor proceeded to laugh. So again, that just gives you a little bit more insight into what some of the students are reporting, experiencing in the learning environment. But again, we were very interested in having a better understanding in how these experience, experiences impacted wellness. And to do so, we quantified the frequency of microaggressions and stratified them into quintiles. And we did a regression looking to how that experience of microaggressions was associated with, again, a student screening positive for depression. And as we move from that lowest quintile, which is the lowest frequency of microaggressions to the highest quintile, you can see that students, again, almost in a dose-dependent manner are significantly more likely to screen positive for depression, such that students in that highest quintile were seven times more likely to screen positive for depression than students in the lowest quintile. So again, in our, in our very exploratory study, we are seeing um, an association between the experience and the frequency of microaggressions and student wellness. Again, we're also interested in how these experiences impacted satisfaction in medical school. And to do so just in a very simplistic way, we divided our study cohort into two groups. Uh, the first group was the 50% of students that experienced a microaggression, at least weekly, which we labeled the higher exposure group. And the other 50% of our cohort that experienced microaggressions less frequently, which we labeled the lower exposure group. And when we compared the two, Students in the higher exposure group were significantly less likely to state that they'd recommend their medical school to friends, significantly less likely to consider their current institution for residency training, less likely to state that they donate money to their medical school to their future alum, they were more likely to state that they've chosen to miss class in medical school, more likely to state that they consider medical school transfer, and ultimately more likely to state that they're considering withdrawing from medical school altogether. So here you can see from, again, a very exploratory study, but with implications suggesting that not only is the experience of microaggressions very common in medical school, but they are associated with significant implications in terms of the future of the diversity of the healthcare workforce. So again, from these three studies, we can see differences in how students are perceived, valued, and ultimately included in the learning environment that may have significant implications on the future state of diversity um, that we see in academic medicine and among practicing physicians in general. And I'd now like to take any questions. <laughs>